I need to build something to make it better than the way I found it. Not what I found was bad, not the way I found was negative, but I need to make it better than the way I found it. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 34 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Richard Osborne. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also Whistlekick's founder. And here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out what we offer, like our extra padded but still comfortable shin guards. You can find more information about those and the rest of our stuff at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests on the podcast. And now for today's episode. On episode 34, we're joined by Mr. Richard Osborne, a Taekwondo practitioner and school owner with a strong tie to the competitive side of martial arts. As a competitor and tournament promoter, Mr. Osborne speaks warmly about his time spent in competition. It's clear from our conversation that Mr. Osborne's love of martial arts has threaded its way into his entire life, and he wouldn't have it any other way. And so, Mr. Osborne, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad we can make this happen. You're coming out of part of the country that I don't really know. And of course, our, our last episode was with Mr. Corey Rose, who introduced us. So looking forward to get to know you a little bit. You as well, sir. You as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this this shows a lot more about you than it is me. I mean, we make <laughs> some bits about me in here, but is you're the one in the hot seat. Yes, sir. And, and being that that's where we are with you in the hot seat, why don't you tell me, tell the people listening a little bit about how you got started in the martial arts? Well, you know, I come from a family of martial artists. Um, my father back in the mid 80s, uh, again, you know, you kind of have to disclose your age sometimes. Uh, about 85, 86, I believe is the, the last part of 85. I started at uh, the tender age of seven years old. Um, you know, at that time in the mid 80s, uh, after the Karate Kid come out, you know, more and more children started doing martial arts. And, and that movement going towards kids started happening more and more. Um, at that time, my father swore up and down that he would not <laughs> have a children's class. And, uh, and me and about six others were actually part of the first children's class that he started teaching. And uh, so, you know, as a, having a father that was a full contact fighter and a, and a tournament fighter and, and big into the martial arts, you know, it was only natural for me to, to start classes. You know, at that time, you're, you're small. You, you think it's cool. You, you know, you're, you're kicking, you're punching. So it was an easy transition for me to do, to, to walk into that and, and to be able to start doing that. Uh, I also have a young brother that uh, is also a participant. He's about seven years younger than me. Uh, and so this is kind of like what we do, you know, as far as the Midwest goes, you know, our, our family has a reputation dating back from the early 80s uh, of being in the martial arts. Uh, you know, certain families have legacies or they have uh, what they're known for. And, and my family is known for martial arts. So you know, our our scope doesn't probably go outside of our region very much. Uh, but, you know, from the Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, uh, if you're in those four states and you've been around martial arts in the last 30 years, uh, you've definitely heard my father's name. And, and I've been trying to branch out and, and distinguish myself also as a martial artist in this region. Um, I, you know, I got my black belt in the late 80s. At, at that time, I was one of the youngest black belts in the region. Um, you know, my father is a big believer on, on not promoting uh, based off age. If you're ready, uh, he promotes you. And uh, even though I was I was very young and I'm sure a lot of people at that time, you know, I know feelings have changed over the years. But, you know, at that point in time, he felt like it was, a, it was an opportunity for me to be uh, a black belt. And uh, started we actually was in tournament competition way before then. You know, I started tournament competition probably within the first three months of me starting. I had my first tournament. So, you know, and that was another progression. Another thing that we do as far as the sports side of things goes. But uh, I got my black belt at an early age and I've been going ever since. Started teaching in the early 90s and I've either taught my father or have my own school 
uh, since the early 90s. Wow. So it's easier for me to do the math on this stuff because our age is, is right in line, maybe give or take a year or so. And and our martial arts career started at just about the same time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're twins in that <laughs> sense. So, yeah, that, that must have been um, – Certainly, I know in our region, it would have been very uncommon for someone of your age to have earned a black belt by that time. Did you feel any, I guess, pressure or did you feel uncomfortable at all with that or were you too young to even realize it? Well, you know, I tell you what, you you don't get the perception at that point in time. You're still young. You're going to tournaments, you know, and, you know, the biggest, probably the biggest impact for me, you know, I'll, with social media now and stuff the way things are now, if someone achieves rank or if a child does something, a parent or somebody like that can post it all over the internet. You know, for me as walking, you know, to school or doing stuff like that, you know, I didn't broadcast out that I was a, a nine-year-old black belt. You know, I didn't, that wasn't a projection of me out to everybody else in the public. So me walking around and just being a normal kid, it really didn't have an effect. The effect that I seen and I've seen more of it now that I go and reflect back on those years was the tournament side of things. Uh, my father was a very successful tournament fighter and full contact fighter. You know, when I started first coming up, you know, I was not very talented in the sports side of things. You know, I didn't hit my maturity as a, as a, as a better competitor probably until my early teens, probably 12, 13. So at that point in time, I always got somebody's best. And what I mean by that, even at an early age, you know, that's, oh, that's, and, and people in the Midwest refer to me as Little Richie. That's, that's kind of how my dad's Richard Osborne Sr. I'm Richard Osborne Jr. But people, even at 37 years old, I still get the label of Little Richie. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the label. It's stuck with me even through the years. <laughs> but a lot of the guys that still do that are masters in, in other systems and stuff like that. So I don't ever go and say, hey, look, you know, I'm Richard now. I'm Richard Osborne. Jr. I don't ever say, yeah, I'm Little Richie. Yep, 37, 47, 57, doesn't matter. I always be Little Richie, and that's how we'll do it. But, right. you know, at that point in time, you know, that's where I probably felt it the most because I wasn't very talented, but being my father's success, if, if they had a senior student that was, you know, and at that point in time back in the early and late 80s, you know, the divisions were broke down, so you were fighting – just about anybody. You could be a yellow belt fighting a junior black. I mean, the divisions weren't broke up like they are now. So if there was a fighter, and usually I think there was the age groups were even like within three or four years. Now as you got every two years on age group. So the, what I felt was the impact of my father being successful is that I got everybody's best. Or if somebody had a good fighter, they made sure that that was the first. You know, I could travel to Hayes, Kansas, and I my first fight would be the top guy in that region. And so, you know, that's probably, but as a, it's not a negative thing. It was more of a positive aspect because I always got everybody's best and it wasn't by choice. It was just because of, of the lineage that I come from. Everybody knew my father was a good athlete and he was a good fighter. So naturally everybody thought I was too. It's like, Hey, well, you know, we're, you know, if we can't beat senior today, we're going to beat up on junior, you know? So we got, I got a lot of those right. transactions as far as tournaments go. I always seem yeah. to draw, <laughs> you know, one time at a tournament, uh, we are running, I think we drove four hours to Southeast Missouri and we're running four hours on a highway. I think we woke up at three or four o'clock that morning and, and we walk in and we're late and, you know, we brought a big crew that day, but as soon as we walk in the door, we asked the tournament promoter, Hey, you know, we're, we're running late. We're sorry. We brought this many people. Can we get just a couple minutes to warm up? No, you guys can't. You guys are late. Your division started. Richie, you're first in your division. You're the first one to I had 27 kids in my forms division that day. And as soon as I got out of the car, I put my uniform on and had to go right in. Now, luckily, I wound up in the top three. But those were kind of some of the things as being a young black belt and being with somebody that has some has some recognition and some name. You know, those were kind of the impact I felt. You know, as a kid, you know, walking around as a black belt, I don't know if it was just my demeanor at that time. But that humble spirit actually kind of even at a young age, I never walked around and go, hey, you want to see a kick? You want to see a punch? You want to see this or see that? You know, it reflected back in my school with uh, my elementary teachers and junior high and stuff like that. You know, that humbleism showed at an early age. So a lot of people on the street never knew unless they knew my father or knew where heritage he come from. They didn't know I was a black belt. And most people today, when I walk around now, 
don't know that I'm in martial arts unless we have a conversation about it. Wow. It, it, it's interesting, and I can kind of put myself into that that scenario and that one that you mentioned specifically about getting to the tournament, running a few minutes late. I think, you know, we've all done that. And of course, back then, back in the late 80s, if you're going to a tournament that you'd never been to before, you know, you're pulling out a map. Yeah. I mean, there's no G- there's no GPS. <laughs> no. So, you know, you put some restriction or, or you, you guess wrong. Yeah, you're going to show up a little late. But yeah, I can completely see that pressure, that expectation that people had of you living up to the legacy of your father and then having to to jump right in there and not being given any th- them erring so far on the side of not giving you special treatment to give you less than than adequate treatment even right right and that, so but that builds you know it, it, and i have never looked at that kind of things as, as a negative i mean but those all these issues or anything that i've went through in my earlier stages all help mold and build you know and that's why i'm a, a big proponent of sport martial arts i mean i have i carry that flag with me uh about as hard as anyone i won't say i'm the i'm the one that holds it the most i'm just saying you know i, I feel like i can compete with anybody when it comes to carrying that banner for sport martial arts i mean that is something that that built me it was not just the martial arts it's what we did you know as a, like you said you know i as a young man, you know, I had to travel four, five, six, seven hours on the road, uh, you know, leaving early from school, making sure my schoolwork was done and traveling and going competing all weekend, driving back, you know, and having responsibility. I had to keep up my own uniform, you know, make sure, you know, though there was just so many elements of, of the sports side of it when I was so young, you know, and, and we go to national tournaments for four days and my father would be like, look, here's 25 bucks. It's Thursday night. You got to make this thing last until Sunday. You know, and that's, I mean, it was just, there's so many different elements of part of the sport side of things is that that's kind of what we, or what I strive for today is why I'm so big into the sports side of martial arts is kind of those early developments I had as a younger uh, black belt or a younger student, you know, traveling around the Midwest, you know, and, and building those kind of characteristics that carried over into my adult life. Yeah. I think we've got a pretty good picture of of who you are at a, at a top level, you know, kind of a bird's eye view. But here at Martial Arts Radio, we're all about stories. And we want to learn about you through your story. So I'd like you to take a second and then tell us your best martial arts story. Best martial arts story. Wow. There's a bunch of them. I, I would say, you know, I probably, I would have to go to the present. You know, I, I, I really have to kind of reflect on, on what, my and i'm still not done i'm still working and still trying to do things in the martial arts you know you're you're a white belt you know that saying you're a white belt that never never quit that's what a black belt is it's a white belt that 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 just kept going and that's how i feel like that's where i'm at right now when i look at my martial arts career now is 37 you know i'm just now building something for myself so you know the biggest story i have is kind of the reflection of um, of, of, and again, this is not more of a story. It's just kind of where I'm at right now with martial arts. You know, I feel like, you know, I've, I finally started to learn now. And so, you know, to, to give you stories, my, most of my stories are going to come from the sports side of things. You know, probably the funniest story I've got is, uh, and and everybody likes a little bit of humor in their life. And this is also a humbling thing is that my (laughs) first national tournaments at bluegrass nationals in the early nineties, about 92, 93. Um, at that point in time, I think Bluegrass probably had 2,000 plus competitors. Um, you know, you had people everywhere from all the United States coming up here. And here I get my first chance to fight on stage. This was one of the first times they let the junior black belts fight up on stage. And I, and I didn't win my division. So this is where the story is alluding to. They just let the division fight up on stage. So I had 20, 30 kids on, uh, on stage fighting. In my very, very first fight, um, I'd get, I, I get a young man. I don't know what age he was. That We were probably, uh, let's see, we were probably 13, 14 years old at that time. And uh, this, this kid had a bit, every bit of 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and my dad told me, he's, watch his legs, watch his legs. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, in the first 30 seconds of the match, I took a spin heel kick to the face. And in front of about, oh, I'd say 
there was probably 2,000 competitors, probably another three or 4,000 spectators. Uh, I got myself knocked out right up on stage. So here was my oh. first chance to go in front of a, from, you know, a national tournament to be able to go, okay, you know, here I am, this kid from the Midwest. Nobody knows who I am. I'm going to make a name for myself today. And I sure did make a name for myself as dropping like a <laughs> sack of potatoes. So that was, that was probably one of the most humbling things I've done because I thought I'd, you know, here I've been winning all these tournaments in the Midwest. I'm going to go out here to this big national tournament. And I'm going to show everybody what I got. And boy, did I show, I showed everybody how fast I could fall. That's how, that's what I got to show. Um, you know, I've got to meet a lot of people over the years, you know, so my story is more about who I've got to meet. There's a lot of legends in the Midwest. If people aren't familiar with the Midwest, you know, there's a lot of history around here. You know, we've got a lot of, and I'm going to name drop some other names, but these are some of the people I've got to meet over the years that I'm just awestruck, you know. One of the ones we've got, Mr. Yarnell, if, for those of you that are, are sport people, uh, you know, if you relate to Mr. Yarnell, a lot of people are going to know who Mr. Yarnell is, but the Gateway Classic back in the 60s and 70s, I think even going back to the 50s, was one of the big tournaments in St. Louis, you know, and growing up with him and, and being able to see him in the environment of doing that, you know, he's right here in St. Louis, Missouri, you know, he's one of the founding fathers of sport martial arts, and, and, and he had... Chuck and, and Joe and those guys all came through St. Louis to do that. So we've got a lot of legends in here. One of the other ones we've got here, and again, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of getting away from myself here, but these are kind of the people that we, I've got to surround myself with. Uh, we've got the gentleman that, that trained with um, Elvis uh, back in the uh, 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s. Uh, we've got Wayne Carmen, which is down here in Branson, Missouri. And he wrote the book, Elvis and Me, and got to talk about the, the different things that Elvis was working on before he died. You know, he was working on a film that most, I don't know if most people know, but there was a film that he was trying to produce called The uh, Modern Gladiators, I believe is what the name of the title was. You know, and, and Bill Wallace was in that, uh, he's in that, if you go on YouTube and look up some of that production, you know, Elvis was trying to say, hey, look, we're going to build this tournament up. We're going to put these karate fighters together. And we're going to show the world karate. You know, we're going to show them what what the new age gladiators are. So, you know, a lot of my encounters, a lot of my stories is just the people I get to meet. You know, martial arts to me in the sports side of things has introduced me to so many different, you know, individuals, you know, on the sports side or just the martial arts and, and part of the movie scene. So, you know, it's just been a it's been a heck of a ride for me. And so, you know, most of my stories are going to be about wins and losses in the ring. But, you know, the, my main stories and the things that I've got are the people I've, I've, I've had to meet or got to meet, you know, over the, the last 30 years of me doing martial arts. Okay. So obviously the martial arts has been with you through your entire life. You know, I can't really ask you. One of the questions that we like to ask on the show is, how has the martial arts changed you? But I'm going to guess that if I ask you that question, you're not really going to have a great answer because there isn't a whole lot of you that didn't involve the martial arts. So let's try going at this a different way. Imagine a, a parallel universe where you never entered the martial arts. And, and imagine where you might be now, what you might be doing and tell us a little bit about that. Where do you think you would be? I, you know, I, I don't know if I would have the goals that I have now or, or achieve what I have now if it wasn't for martial arts. Um, you know, I still think as a person, you still are, are you know, the people are, you're as a person, you know, I don't think martial arts made me a good person or a bad person. You know, I think I would still have that element of, of doing the right thing and having the high uh, moral standards. You know, I don't know if I would be striving for what I do now. In my professional career right now, I'm into uh, marketing and sales and, and doing things like that. You know, I, I don't know if I wasn't doing more sorts, um, if I wouldn't do something that was more dealing with people. Uh, you know, I was much more reserved when I was a kid until more sorts opened me up. So I think I would be doing something that wouldn't be. I, don't, I think more career wise, I think I would be probably something a little bit more subdued. Um, I may not be more of aggressive. You know, my family grew up as in most families did back in the early ages. You, you got a job when you were younger and you stayed at that job for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. You retired. You worked at a factory or you worked at a plant. And, you know, that's how my father was. That's how my grandfather was. You went somewhere you worked. And, 
you know, I think I would be, I think it would be more on the professional side of things. You know, I am, I, I, I am a professional martial artist, but I don't do it as a commercial school. I don't do it to make money. So I think my professional career and what I did as a profession would have been different. I think I'd probably be working somewhere uh, with a job that wasn't requiring me to go out and meet people and to and to socialize and do that kind of career. You know, again, I'm in marketing and sales now. So, you know, I, I think professionally I would be in a different realm. You know, I still think I would have met my wife. I still believe those things are destined. You're going to meet the person you're going to fall in love with. You're going to marry that person. I still think you I think that's all preordained and you're going to do those things. So I don't think that would have changed. I just think professionally, the martial arts opened me up. So I think I would have went a different direction as far as what I wanted to do as far as a daytime job and, and how I pursued things. You know, I don't think my sports career would have been as good as it was. You know, I played football, earned a scholarship to play football when I was younger. You know, I think, I think I would have been, maybe I would have done something different. You know, maybe I wouldn't have been involved with sports. You know, I think there, there is a lot of different avenues that, that I probably wouldn't has been aggressive with if it wasn't for martial arts, I, w- I probably would have been pictured as more of a subdued, just, you know, normal nine to five guy taking care of the family and doing that. Not that I don't do that now, but, you know, there's a lot more that that's to me. I'm more, I don't want to say the word complicated because my wife is going to use that word. She definitely thinks I'm complicated. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think there's more elements to me than there would have been if I'd not had the martial arts. If that makes any sense, if that, it, if that it rambling does. does any justice at yeah. all to, to what I was trying to go with. Well, to be fair, you know, I've I've just thrown you into a hypothetical situation. Sure. You know, and I said parallel universe. I mean, <laughs> that's that's, yeah, that's complicated to start with. So, no right, worries, right. no worries at all there. But let's bring it back to reality for a second. And I'd like you to think about a challenging time in your life and how your experience and your training in the martial arts helped you through that. Well, you know, um I would say, I would say probably, probably my middle, probably teenage years through high school, you know, that, that is probably one of the toughest times, you know, um, that I I think kids can sometimes go through. There's a lot of things going on with, with kids, you know, about the teenage years, they start developing personalities and hormones and you got a lot of stuff going on. You know, uh, when I was growing up, my 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 family wasn't financially blessed. We didn't have a whole lot of uh, of money at that time, and you know my mom and dad did the best they could to try and provide for us financially. And you know some of the things that martial arts built in me was to go out and earn my own way. You know I started working at a young age, uh, you know making money and, and working with my father. Uh, some of the places where he worked, where you know I was able to pick up some extra cash and stuff like that. So you know. Those kind of characteristics kind of helped me through those times because my mother and father were working from sun up to sundown and, and sometimes two or three jobs. And I was doing martial arts and trying to play football and basketball. And at the same time, I had to try and find work. And I don't think, you know, martial arts teaches a lot of drive. It, it teaches commitment. Uh, it teaches work ethic. There's a lot of things that the elements that go into it, you know, and as a young man, and, and I want things, and I want to be able to go and buy this, and I want to be able to do that, but at the same time, I want to play football, or I want to play basketball, I want to go to tournaments, you know, those elements, you know, I, I you know, you had to go out and work for it, and you, it took a hard work, you know, you get up at six o'clock in the morning, you go to school all day, you go to football practice, and then you go to a job, and then you work, and then you get back up, and you do it again, and you did that seven days a week, you know, I, I'm not saying that martial arts is the only way to build work ethic because some people are just have work ethic. They just come from hard working families and they just work hard, you know, and, but I think through that, I think that helped build me. So, you know, I, I would say, and I'm not saying just one year, I'm saying those were, you know, from junior high to high school, you know, we, we burned the candle. I mean, we were, and my father probably, I don't know, at one point in time, I think he hit 40 to 50 tournaments in one year. I mean, there was weekends. Sometimes we hit a tournament on Saturday in Arkansas and then we would drive back home and go to sleep, wake back up, and we would hit a tournament in St. Louis. We would go from one wow. end of the region to the other end of the region in one weekend. And and there was multiple weekends when we did things like that. And if I didn't have the drive and the determination and the work ethic, there's no way, I, you know, I plus I had to keep up on schoolwork. 
You know, I, I didn't have, I wasn't a honor student by any means. You know, I carried a three, I think a three, four GPA. I think it's what a three, four, three, five. I think that's what my GPA is was as it was at that time. So I had a decent grade point average, you know, but, uh, you know, there was a lot going on at that point in time. And then at the same time, I had to try and pick up work and work and, and to be able to buy the things that I wanted. So, you know, I, I think that period of time, it helped me get through that. So what was it about competition? Because, I mean, that's certainly we're seeing that as a theme through our conversation here, that competition, that the sports side of martial arts is very important to you. And clearly it was back then. I don't think I've known anybody else that's competed to 40 to 50 events in a year. I mean, for this year, we'll, we will have been at, uh, I think, close to 25. And that's included some multiple weekends, so I can certainly empathize with the challenges there. But you, you must have really loved competition well, to make to, to carve out such a large chunk of your life for it. Well, you know, again, this is going back to, you know, I can't take the cre- all the credit for the things that I do. You know, my father was the the driving force for that kind of stuff. You know, he was the one wanting to go, you know, back in in, in most in people that, that listen to this are going to be able to relate, you know, back in the 80s and early 90s when we didn't have social media, you know, we didn't have things you know, you would hear a rumor about a tournament or you would hear a rumor or maybe somebody would speak at a tournament about this tournament over in Kansas or Oklahoma, or Arkansas, and you had to wait a year to go to that tournament. And so what he would do is he would just build up a list of like, okay, we heard this group of fighters are really good down in Arkansas. We missed their tournament this year. We're going to put it on the calendar. The thing was, is that he kept building the calendar. And then we would Mm. run, you know, and I didn't get to go to all 40 or 50 of the tournaments that he ran that year, you know, because financially, sometimes it wasn't in the cards for us to be able to do that. And he had to go out there and explore those tournaments and and sometimes even go out to the tournaments and go, you know what, that's not a good one. We're probably not going to go back to that one. And so, (laughs) you know, and so but I, 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 I really didn't appreciate the tournaments. You know, I as a kid, and I'll be honest, and this is this is straight coming from, you know, honesty as a kid. You know, sometimes I didn't want to get in that car. I didn't want to drive. You know, I knew what was facing me at 10, 11 years old. I'm like, man, we got to drive down to somewhere in Arkansas. Uh, the, you know, the 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 highway is going to be windy. I'm probably going to get nauseated because I'm going to be sick. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to have to fight the best kid. You know, I'd probably be rather be home watching cartoons you know, and and doing that kind of stuff. And then I would get to the tournament and then I would get second, third, maybe first place. And then, you know, of course your demeanor changes when you win or if you win a grand champ or do something like that, your demeanor changes. But, you know, it was hard for me to get up for tournaments when I was young. You know, we didn't have the game systems and we did a lot of stuff. You know, we wanted to watch cartoons. We wanted to go play outside. We wanted to do those things as a kid. But, you know, my father pushed, you know, he said, Hey, look, we're going to get up. We're going to do this. And it, it paid off for me. And I, and now that passion that I I didn't know I had been, it developed into a passion. And now I, you know, we, of course, it's almost impossible now with family structures and the way things are. It's hard. You hitting 25 tournaments in a year and the year's not over. That's amazing to me. You know, right now I hit maybe a dozen and I, my head, I feel like my head's spinning, you know, <laughs> when I hit 12 in this, you know, uh, um, you know, the one thing is that we don't, our tournaments aren't as abundant here and we don't, um, uh, the travel, we have to travel a lot. I've, I've put maybe a little over 4,000 miles on my car this year on traveling. Uh, you know, the nearest tournaments, are our tournaments were they're within a hundred miles and then other tournaments are with 300 miles. So, you know, there's a lot of traveling involved and it, and it was tough and especially really tough back then. The highway systems back there, back then are still nowhere near what they are now. So it was hard travel, You're eating fast food, getting up early in the morning. It was tough at first. And, but yeah. I tell you what, it developed me now to where my passion is, I mean, I actually just, I, I love the sports side of things and that I didn't know it then, but now it developed into what it is now. And that's why the love of sport martial arts kind of just flows through me now. I mean, it's because of what, what we did back then. So one of the subjects that, that comes up in conversation between me and, and others is kind of around that, that piece and that you mentioned, you know, your your adolescent years there, where I don't know if I want to say you were forced, but that's kind of the impression that I'm getting 
hearing you talk about it, you were strongly encouraged to go to these events, even if you didn't want to. Is that is that a fair thing? To that say? is that is absolutely fair. I mean, okay, you know, and like I said, you know, just being a kid, I was just a normal kid. I wasn't anything. I would not call myself a spectacular kid by any means. As far as you know, I was just a normal kid, and like you said, it was kind of one of those things where dad's going, you're going. <laughs> sure, sure. So one of the things that comes up when I talk to parents of adolescent children who have been training for a while, you know, six, seven years, sometimes more, and the kid is starting to feel that pressure that they've, you know, most of us felt in junior high and high school for wanting to go do a more conventional sport, mm -hmm. soccer or something like that. And the, they're seeking advice for, you know, do, do they force their kid to continue because they see the benefits that martial arts has had? for their children and ultimately for their family? Or do they let the kid step away and hope that they leave with a good enough impression of martial arts that they come back later on? Now you've kind of got an interesting perspective here, I'm hoping, because you're, you were experiencing the same sort of things that all kids were around, or I should say most kids do, around martial arts, specifically around competition. But here now, competition is the part of it that you love the most. What changed in there? And do you think your father was making the right decision in strong arming you into doing these? You know, that is, that is almost an individual question for individual kids. If you, okay. So if you'd step back and you looked at the overall picture, I would say, yes, I would encourage parents too many times now that I see. Well, let's okay. Let, go ahead. Let's, I'm sorry. Let's talk about you. About me. Let's let's, let's hold. Yeah. Okay, let's hold okay. this in on you. If you know, if you if if this all happened again, mm -hmm. you know, knowing what you know now, right? I wouldn't have changed a thing. I would. Okay. I wouldn't. I absolutely would not have changed a thing. What what he laid the foundation for me. Again, your parents lay the foundation, and it's up to you as an individual to build on from there. And so his foundation that he set for me and what he did for me back then, absolutely, I wouldn't change anything. The negatives, the positives, I would keep it all the same. Okay. So now let's take a step back from it. Okay. And now what kind of advice might you offer if, if someone came to you with the same kind of dilemma about their child? Well, and that's, and, that, and it's, like I said, it, it is almost individualized for each child. But the thing to me especially with kids. And let's say, in, are we talking about more of the sport aspect? Like if, if a child wanted to go and do soccer or baseball or, or wanted to go pursue another sport and then leave martial arts completely, is that kind of one of the realm we're kind of dealing with? Yeah, I think that's how it tends to happen. Okay. That's what I generally observe. I, to me, I would find the best way to keep that child in martial arts. And, and here's why I say that. Even if it's on a limited basis, even if it's if it's going to class once a week, once every other week, you know, most of the time when they get to that point, typically they're at a black belt level, but they're still learning. To me, as a martial arts, you're always learning. But I would find a way for that child to be able to still do the sport that they want to go and venture out to, but still have a piece of the martial arts. Unless they move away and they have to find another school, and that's a different story. But if you're still in the same your neck of woods and your school's still running, you're still operating, I would find a way even if it's on a teaching basis, you know, that is the one thing I see a lot of now that maybe didn't happen then is that our instructors are getting younger. Um, I see more development with instructors, you know, under the age of 18, there's a lot of instructors in schools. When you talk about a staff of people, you have your over 18 instructors and you have your under 18 instructors, you know, and so there's different avenues or different ways to pursue. And sometimes kids get the burnout factor, especially if they're a tournament junkie. You've got a kid that's been competing since six years old. They've been traveling from coast to coast. They've gone to all the national tournaments they can. They've won every title they can. What else do they have to prove? Well, how much teaching have you done in class? Well, I haven't really taught anybody. Well, have you developed any students? No, I haven't done that yet. Well, there's an avenue. It's trying to find the avenue for that child. Uh, or, you know, I hate to call them child because they get 17 years old. They want to be called a child anymore. They want to be called adult. But sure. as they develop, you've got to try and find what is going to be the hot button to keep them involved? Because here's what happens with sports. And I'm not saying that every kid's going to be able to go, 
some kids are going to be able to go and get scholarships and they're going to be able to go and play football and get four years paid for. And then if they're thinking about a professional career, and we all know it's just purely statistics, that ratio diminishes a lot. If, if you got somebody that gets maybe a four-year scholarship to play college ball, their possibilities of playing professional ball is, is, is slim. It's very slim. Very. And so yes. they graduate and they've got a degree and they did martial arts for most of their life. And then they come and they, they have something to come back to. You know, I, I still would want them to be active. And like I said, it could be just going down to once a week and one hour of training or one hour of teaching for me. But I still want them to be involved with it. But I would do it to a level that they won't notice it taking away from their other sports. You know, keeping them active, keeping them involved, because martial arts is a lifelong thing. You know, who knows if we get a kid that that leaves our sport or leaves martial arts and they go play football for four years and they don't make it pro and then they get a business degree and they come back to it and they go, you know, uh, Mr. Osborne, I want to open up my own school now. You know, here you've got a, 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 a kid or somebody that now can expand not only his self and go into business and start more schools and do that. But, you know, if you're a part of a, a business strategy to where you are trying to build a business or you're building it, here you've got a trained professional that's part of your system that now can go and help you grow. And so, I mean, it, it's almost individualized for each person, but I would strongly encourage to try and find an avenue or something to keep them involved and to keep them going with a school and not have them get away from it completely. Definitely reduce what they were before. Definitely go down, maybe not training five, six days a week, maybe not hitting every tournament every once in a while or every tournament every weekend, but but still maintaining some at level activity with it because, you know, the thing is, with if you're a diehard martial artist, the thing is with it, most, I don't know what the ratio would be because I don't know how we judge that or how we get that statistic, but a lot of people come back to it. They leave it for a right. while, but a lot of people come back to it, but some don't, and I know some don't, but I mean, there's a bunch that, that come right back to it or their kids are going to come back to it or their kids' kids are going to come back to it. So, you know, to me, I would try and find a way for that child to stay with it on some level to, to, to keep active. You're, it sounds like you're talking about compromise, and, and, I, and I agree. I, one of the things that I've observed is that when a child gets to have at least some say, you know, whether it's to leave martial arts completely or to reduce their martial arts commitment so they can feel like they're exploring other things and making that choice for themselves, they are much more likely to come back later in life, That be that in their teen years or their 20s or, or even beyond. So I think it's good advice, and I, I hope people out there are taking that to heart because I think you would agree with me, sir, that the more people in martial arts, the better the world is. I, I totally agree. And, and, <laughs> and again, going back to the sports side of things, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to develop now, you know, and I'm just starting it from a regional level. I'm, I'm by no means I do it on a national level. I'm just trying to do it here is that we lose. We, well, we're losing our Kings. I would call the Kings of martial arts. Our legends are, are getting aging or we're, or we're losing them. You know, we, you know, me and you talked about Joe Lewis earlier, you know, he's passed away and we've got Bill Wallace. You know, our legends of martial arts are our ones that we looked up to when we were growing up. You know, a lot of them are aging and, and, and the superstars that we have now move on to other things and, and we don't keep them. And, and that's one of the things, you know, I'm, I'm always looking around, you know, you know, I'm way past my prime as far as competition level goes and high level competition, but you know, we're not, you know, other than a few names now, we don't have the names like we had before. And so, you know, I think as a, as a whole, like you said, we're, we're trying to keep those, we're trying to develop the new legends. We want the new names. We want right. to be able to keep them, you know, who's, you know, 20 years from now, who is going to be the kids that I'm still teaching? Who are they going to look up to or who are they going to be, you know? And so I think it's a constant struggle with everybody. And I think the sports side is more than anything because, and again, people are like, man, well, you're so much on sport. I'm like, yeah, but if you go to a seminar in the last 30 years, where do those seminars come from? It comes usually, typically, it comes from somebody that was in the, the arena. It was, it was Chuck. It was, it was Bill Wallace. It was, you know, and then you got your fighters from the 80s. You got Nasty Anderson and, and, and Price and Plowden, and, you know, and, and now you've got Raymond Daniels. Uh, you know, it's probably Raymond. And, and now uh, we've got the, the gentleman that just took uh, into the UFC. 
Sage Northcutt. Sage Sage Northcutt. Yeah. yeah. And so now we now we're starting to get some of those sports guys that are going and stepping up to the full contact arena. So I mean, it's helping out, but man, that is a that is it's I don't want to call it an epidemic, but it's one thing that we struggle with right now is because, like you said, what, what else is there for me? I've I've won every national tournament. I can't make a career or a living off martial arts on the sports side of things. You know, other than you open up a new school or you start seminars, you know, there's there's not much for an athlete to be able to make money or earn. So we lose them, you know, or we lose them to something else and then we don't get them back when we could have maybe tried to find a way to, hey, you know, you know you're going to play football for four years. That's great. But, you know, every once in a while, let's get you to a tournament and get you fighting, you know, as, as long as we don't yeah. get you hurt, you know. So, you know, I, I, I want that more where kids are staying in and, and we're keeping them because – Man, after 18, boy, it is a – and it may be just me. Maybe it's just in my region the impact of it. But, man, I don't know if that's coast to coast, but it feels like we lose them after that 18, 19-year-old demographic. We just kind of lose them, male and female. It, it does become hard, and a, a lot of it has to do with money. You know, when people – you know, my, my competitive career ended because, as you said, I, I didn't see any other big challenges – for me to tackle. Right. And it happened when I was 17. And so of course you wander off and you do other things, but, um, without going on, on the tangent, the, the one piece that I'll leave out there, um, more for listeners than, than for our own discussion is that, uh, if there's one thing that we want to change here at whistle kick, it's, it's getting more people into martial arts. If there's two, it's getting some money into martial arts so that we don't lose those people so that individuals that have incredible talent can spend their days, their career can be developing themselves into the best martial artist possible because that's what we, what I personally believe is going to help us advance martial arts as a sport and as a discipline more than anything else. Oh, I agree 100%. I agree 100%. Good. So you mentioned some pretty cool names there. You know, people that, you know, we, we've had Bill Wallace on the show. We've had some other pretty great people on the show that I'm sure if we compared names, you, you would know most of them and probably have trained or met the majority of them. But other than your original instructor, your father, who would you say has been the most influential person in your martial arts career? Well, I, that is actually probably one of the easiest thing. Um, as far as a martial arts career, if there was one uh, gentleman that made an impact, and I've seen this gentleman maybe, at best, I've seen this gentleman twice a year. But I spent my early years up until his passing, I believe he passed away in 05, 06, uh, was, was Mr. Ken Eubanks with the Bluegrass Nationals. And again... This is somebody that I only talk to once or twice a year, but the impact that he made on me was, was unbelievable. And I only realize it now as an adult, and I didn't see it as a kid, you know, but every year we would, we would gear up to go to his tournament. And here's why I say the impact that he made on me. Um, if there was ever a humble martial artist or a humble person in martial arts, it was him. Um, through the sports side of things, he was able to take this little tournament in Kentucky and grow it into this massive tournament. And the reason why he did that was because of who he was. It wasn't because the Bluegrass gave away thousands of dollars. It wasn't because the Bluegrass was – and not that Louisville isn't a cool town. It's a great town. I'm not saying it isn't. But I'm just saying here it is in the middle of Kentucky, in the middle of America, in the heartland of America. And this gentleman was going to be able to get the best of the best athletes to come in. And the reason why he did that was because of who he was as an individual, as a martial artist. Uh, if, if for those of you that don't know who Ken Eubanks was, um, uh, I believe his, his practicing style was Goju. Um, he was a strong tournament competitor, very strong. His son was a very good tournament competitor. But he was probably one of the most humble men that you've ever seen. He, he judged at everybody's tournament. He went to other people's tournaments. And he knew – who martial artists were, you know, I, again, I, I tell a story, my highest placing, again, this is going back to sport, but this is the kind of the impact it's had on my life. You know, my highest placing at Bluegrass was fourth place. You know, I was a kid from Springfield, Missouri, going to Louisville in front of thousands of people and doing a tournament. And my highest ranking ever was fourth place at Bluegrass. But Ken, out of all those people, Ken knew who his competitors were. 
And he watched those kids grow up and he kept track of those kids. I mean, Ken knew who I was. Ken could even recite before he before he passed away. The last time I got seen was down in Branson, Missouri. And he was actually at it was Mr. Carmen, Bill Wallace, Ken Eubanks. And there was a couple other legends there at the same time. And we're sitting in this little B gym in, in, in South, you know, Southwest Missouri. And people really didn't realize what was around us at that time. I mean, they mm. really just didn't get grasp the scope of who was around us. But he even remembered the uniform I wore back in 88. He remembered the Stars and Stripes. So, again, my interactions with him was very limited. And it was very, very few and far between. But the impact he had on me was a reflection of what I do now. You know, he made sure that his sport or the people around him were going to grow. And he watched and made sure that those people were developing. And if you were developing, he made sure to keep track and tabs on you because he wanted you to be able to showcase that at his event. Again, of course, his event grew to this huge tournament in the United States. But, I mean, he when it come back down to it, he knew who the eighth place person was, the seventh place. I mean, he knew he knew who martial artists were. He kept track. I mean, I, I, like I said, I was not a superstar by any means, but he knew who I was. He knew my name. He knew where I came from. I mean, even, you know, he always made sure to make a, a gesture or something, even if he was with a thousand people around him. If he seen me, he would make a gesture towards me, just a wave or something like that. And he would do that with everybody. It wasn't just me. It wasn't because I was special. What I'm saying is he did that to thousands of people. And that humbleism and that show of respect to everybody. It, wasn't, it doesn't matter if, if you're a, a martial artist that's got 150 students or if you're a martial artist that's got two students. The same respect was shown for each instructor and each student, no matter what you came from, no matter what your talent level was. The respect, the humbleism that he showed was for every single person. And so, you know, when I look at an impactful person in martial arts, other than my father, again, my father's going to be number one because he's the one that got me through it. But I would right. say Mr. Eubanks is probably, that's probably that person looking on the outside in. That was the one that probably made the biggest impact on me without him. He probably never knew it. And, you know, before his passing, he would have never known. And I'd never got to express my gratitude for what he did for me. But, uh, you know, that, that he made a deep impact on me for sure. And I think a lot of us have somebody like that in our past um you know i won't go into it but i was lucky enough that 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 person that version of that person was actually one of the guests on the show here so awesome i'll, I'll let i'll let listeners guess as to who <laughs> that might have been I'll probably get some get some emails now so let's open it up a little bit so from the person that did have an impact to the person that you would have wanted to have had an impact if you could train with anybody alive or dead for any reason, who would that be? You know, this one's gonna this one's gonna sound generic or off the wall, and people probably maybe chuckle a little bit. But I tell you what, somebody that I thought that would be an awesome person to train with, and, and again, this is gonna I know it's gonna kind of blow people's minds a little bit, but from watching the videos, from hearing the stories, and these are all stories that are collected from other people that talk about it. But you know, I'm loving the setup, by the way. Well, I just you're, you're really good at this dramatic reveal thing. <laughs> well, I just keep going. I just, keep going. I, I just want to make sure that people understand that I, I know from the outside in. But if you, I, I study a lot with him and I listen to the stories. But it would have been Elvis. Elvis, I, he, even at an earlier time in the '60s and late '60s and early '70s before his death, he had a passion for karate like probably nobody else. I mean, his movements reflected it, his, 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 his wardrobe and stuff like that. But here was a guy that was a big-time performer, and his goal was to take karate and put it to the mainstream. I mean, to make a movie. He was making a movie about karate fighters, you know. And there was a story, I think, what Mr. Carmen talks about the story. You know, uh, Bill Wallace's first knee surgery was paid for by Elvis. Yep. You know, and so, you know, he had such a love for karate and sport karate it would have been great to be around him at that time because he was trying to make sport karate big. Not that it wasn't thin. I think they were fighting on ABC back in the 60s. So it's not like it wasn't on the mainstream, but he had a level that he wanted to take it to like nobody else. And I think if he was still alive today, I think you'd still see him at tournaments today. I mean, that's what kind of love he had for the sport and for the martial arts is, you know, you know, I know he trained with Mr. Parker and I think Kang Ree, I think's where he trained with down in Memphis. So he had that kind of love for all martial artists. It didn't matter who you were. He just kind of 
that passion, you you see it with him when he when you see those small tidbits of video of him talking or the stories that people talk about when they train with him. I think that would have been really, really cool to be around those. And and Elvis was a good martial artist himself, but the people he surrounded him with was like he grabbed whoever was the best at that time. He made sure that they were around him. So the training aspect would have been phenomenal because every time he was around, he had four or five different types of martial artists that were the best at their field around him at that time. So the training would have been, besides the coolness of hanging out with Elvis, I mean, the training would have been phenomenal because you had the best of the best around him at all times. And and he always gathered him around him, and that's who he surrounded himself with was the best. And so the training would have been phenomenal. So I know that's kind of an oddball. People are like, Elvis, why in the heck would you want to train with Elvis? But at that you know, at that point in time, the things that he was trying to do and develop, you know, I don't know if people have dug into his career and what he did, but I mean, it, it would have been, that would have been the place to be. If you were a martial artist mm. and you love the sport, that would have been, that would have been the guy to be with, you know? And so I know, but there's, there's probably a list of, you know, from my sports side of things, there's a list of about 50 guys I would love to train with to show me how to fight better. But, you know, that list is pretty long, but if you, if you just from the, the aspect of, of being in history and where I could have been at that point in time, I think that would have been a great point in time for me. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I'll admit when you first mentioned his name, I, I was, I was set back a little <laughs> bit thinking, Oh, this is, this is kind of an interesting answer. Let's, let's see where he's going to go with this. But as you explained it, I found myself nodding along. Absolutely. I, I don't think anyone can argue your logic. We were lucky enough during the episode with, Bill Wallace to hear a little bit about his time with Elvis. And of course, you know, Elvis was so forward in, into the limelight that he couldn't do anything, literally anything without people talking about it. Right. So we've got a lot of documentation about who he trained with and what his experiences were. And you're right. He was a force of nature. He pulled in the best of the best. And so to train with him meant that you were going to end up training with everybody at that time. So you, it's, it's almost like you cheated the answer, <laughs> so, but, but in a brilliant way. So <laughs> I got to give it to you. Well, thank kind, you. Of, kind of like, you know, it's the, it's the equivalent of, of, you know, getting three wishes and asking for three more wishes on your third wish. <laughs> so good, good on you for that one. Thank you. You're welcome. So, as a martial artist, as someone who enjoys the competition and the showmanship, I'm guessing you're also a big fan of martial arts movies. I I am. I we we started, of course, the Karate Kid was was probably one of my my first ones that I got to see. But yeah, I, I'm a big big martial arts movie guy. You know, I I don't, but there's so many now, I can't keep up with all of them. Oh, it's it's <laughs> out of control, and and I and I absolutely love it. It's it's. You know, we're we're seeing this resurgence of martial arts in popular culture, and I couldn't be happier about it. I mean, one of the most beloved characters on The Walking Dead, which I believe is the number one show on TV, carries a katana mm -hmm. and lops zombies' heads off with it. I mean, it's we're in a great time to be martial arts film and, and television fans. But if you had to pick a favorite martial arts movie, who would that be? Oh, what would man. Well, that has put me on the spot. Absolutely, I, that's what we do here. I, <laughs> Pin you down, make 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 you answer hard questions like, "What's your favorite martial arts flick?" Okay, <laughs> this is this again. This is probably going to be an off ball because there was a mixture of action plus martial arts. But I've got to go back to Chuck. Probably the most greatest scene there is is the first scene of Lone Wolf McQuaid when he starts taking out everybody with machine guns and spin round kick, spin round house. <laughs> I mean, he takes down a whole Mexican cartel with machine guns and spin kicks. He knocks some guy's <laughs> teeth out. That movie right there was pro that I can watch that movie if it's on. Then then my day is done. If that, that whatever <laughs> I was doing at that time is canceled. So, I, but but there's also another one too that rivals it too. And I and I, I always get the names mixed up. But I, I thought it was a, a I thought it was above the law with Steven Seagal. The final fight scene. He fights a gentleman in a kitchen, and it's got to be one of the worst beatings I've ever seen. I think it hits him with a frying pan uh, and iron, and I think he finishes him off with a uh, bottle opener in the eye. And so it is one of the most gruesome martial arts fight scenes. But, you know, Aikido, and, and for what he was doing, it's not that we didn't know that system was out there, but it really got to showcase 
what that was because the attacker just kept running at him with just brute force and he just kept flipping him and moving him around. And that movie, that whole movie was nothing but Steven Seagal just, I think he hit a guy with a pool ball at one point in time and the teeth. I mean, it just, so those two movies are about, if those two movies are on and it's on my TV, uh, you know, my, my poor kids, they need to be fit. No, I'm just teasing. I, I still feed the kids, but <laughs> you know, those, those two will get my attention most of the time. You know, of course, Karate Kid and Rocky and all those will get my attention too. But those two movies, I don't know. They hold a special place in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Above the Law is actually a movie that's been coming up over the last few interviews as not only a good martial arts film, but also the way that most of us want to remember Steven Seagal. Right. Exactly. We want to remember <laughs> that aspect of it. Right. 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 As a little less so the Steven Seagal of today, yes. of course. But, you know, we'll. We, just to remind people that are listening, if you're especially if you're new to the show, we have links to all of this stuff over at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And I'm definitely going to look to see if anyone's broken out that fight scene, that kitchen fight scene on YouTube, <laughs> and we'll we'll embed that in the show notes. We we do that when we can. It's kind of fun. So how about actors? I mean, you you mentioned some of the actors that you liked in those movies, but if you just got to pick a, a favorite actor or two, who would that be? As far as the martial arts side goes, yeah. You know, I'm. You know, I tell you what, it'd probably be now. The 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 perfect weapon was a great movie uh, with um, oh darn it, Mr. Speakman. I can't believe I even yeah. hesitated on the name. But <sighs> right. if you were to take an actor now, his movies, he made three or four movies, and they were all decent. It's not like you know, the perfect weapon was probably the one that got the most acclaim. But if you took an actor, you took a martial artist, turned into an actor and are still an active martial artist, you know, that's, to me, and Chuck can be in the, and, and Norris can be in the same thing, Mr. Norris can be in the same kind of boat, but he really has stayed true to his martial arts roots. You know, his 5.0 Speakman uh, schools are all across the United States. He's still doing seminars. He's still training. You know, he's still doing the same thing. So, you know, I appreciated him going as being an actor and then, once act the acting career, he didn't leave his martial arts. It, it, and Mr. Norris didn't either. And I know there's some other ones too that didn't, but he really stayed true to the martial arts. And he still, you know, in, in most people that are younger now are probably not going to watch that movie or not know who he is. But, you know, he, at that point in time, in the early 90s, that movie was pretty good and pretty big at that time. And he stayed with the martial arts. And so, and he stays humble and he still travels to all of his schools. And even though he was a movie star at one time, I mean, he still is active with his schools and is still developing a system, you know, from Mr. Parker's system. And so it, it's, you know, he's probably one of the ones I look up to more than anyone just because of what his activity is now beyond the limelight. Mm. Yeah, that that's a, a great answer. And, and we've certainly mentioned him on the show before, but uh, more in passing. And, and honestly, I forgot about Perfect Weapon. Yeah. I mean, it, so, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, that movie did have an impact on it. It did. And the title scene out. is the best. I mean, that, that song at the very beginning and he's just working the, the Cali sticks. I mean, that's just, I mean, if that doesn't get you jacked up, somebody has got to, you got to, if you want to get jacked up before an event or you're getting ready to do something, you just got to watch that opening title scene when he's like working the, with the Cali sticks and, and just getting to town with that. And it was like an early nineties techno song at that time. And I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, I got the power. That's what it was. The song was, I got the power. I mean, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that'll that'll get you all pumped up for sure. I, I remember that was the song that everyone did their musical forms to in competition <laughs> yeah. for about eight years yes, after that movie and that song came out. Yes, yes. How about books? Are there any martial arts related books that you might recommend to people? Now, here's where my honesty is going to kick in and probably be like, I cannot believe you don't read as much. But as far as I, I do not. I am more of a movie, and I. this is the one thing that I probably, you know, if, wish I'd done more is read more books. But, you know, I have not dove into any of the martial arts books like I probably should have. You know, my my level of training and, and what I've done over the years has been through experience. And, you know, you watch movies on TV and you do that kind of stuff, but training and going to tournaments and stuff like that. And so not until my later years in life have I – looked at even trying to research and read and do stuff like that. My reading, it comes from the internet, um, studying on my system, you know, my system of Taekwondo, 
uh, come from, you know, I didn't even know where the history was up until probably the last couple of years. And I know that's sad to say, but that's where we were with my system and how we did things. We went to tournaments, we fought, we trained in the dojo, we fought at the dojo, but the history side of things and the other things that come with the knowledge of being a martial arts escaped me. I didn't do those things. I didn't do the research. I didn't know where my form systems come from. I didn't know what the meaning of my system was. And I know people are going to be like, my gosh, you're 37 years old. You've been in martial arts in the mid eighties and you'd never knew where your form. I didn't know what our forms meant. I just knew we did them when we went out there and did them in tournaments and we had to do it hard or we do it, you know? And so those, but that's things that I admit now, you know, that's why I'm like, you know, I'm still learning I, at 37 years old and been in the martial arts in the mid eighties. I'm learning. I'm learning every day. Well, you know, and and that's that's beautiful. I mean, you should be learning every day, and, and that's one of my goals. And uh, we, I was at an event uh, with Whistle Kick this past weekend, and one of the things I like to ask the children as they come up and talk to me for various reasons is, "What did you learn today? What's the thing that you came away from today learning?" And most of them have to think about it. So good, good that you've, you know, you're in your mid thirties and you're not. Oh well, you know, I, I I know what I need to do, and no, you're you're out there, you're trying to better yourself, you're trying to better yourself as a martial artist in the martial arts. But you're not alone. You're not the only person who, first off, doesn't read a lot of martial arts books or or even any books. We've had several guests on the show, and in fact, some of the guests that they've asked to not be asked that question. So, people that have listened to a bunch of episodes. Mr. Osborne is certainly not the first one, but if you do get the the hankering for reading some martial arts books, I know a great place that's got a quite a list built up of recommendations. Excellent. That that, that would be our site. Uh, the one that you know, I, I'm I'm going to guess there. You know, I always imagine that there's an audience out there yelling or or talking to me, talking to you. There's this figurative group of people <laughs> that holds me accountable and sometimes prompts me to ask questions that maybe I'd be a little nervous to ask. But what I'm hearing from that, that audience out there right now is that as a Taekwondo practitioner, if there's one book you read, it would be A Killing Art, which is this kind of very intricate story about all the, the backdoor dealings with Taekwondo in Korea. And it's probably, if it's not the most recommended book we've had on the show, it's second to like book of five rings or something it's 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 in the top few so that might be one that if you get um you get inspired to to check it out but i i don't read a lot of books either i tend to listen to podcasts a lot as you might imagine yes. it's a good format for me so uh, i'm in a good place here doing that so how about how about your goals are there any martial arts related goals that you've got that are keeping you going, keeping you pumped up? Well, I, I don't know if the, I don't know if the enthusiasm of sport martial arts and martial arts in general has any way came through in my voice and in my talkings and dealings with you today. But my passion for martial arts is probably at an all time high right now. You know, the, the things that I am trying to do again, my I still like to go out and compete. I still like to fight. I still like to do those things. But I know m what my my spot or my responsibility is, is to, again, we went back to talking about building up legends and building up on the sports side. As far as me, and let me say for the teaching aspect first, you know, I, I teach to build, build people. I mean, that is probably the one of the things when I've talked about martial arts, character building or character improvement, uh, building better citizens, I always say citizens, but trying to build better people, you know, not every kid that I've got is going to want to do a tournament or not going to fight. But if I take a, a, a kid that had Asperger's or ADHD or or maybe I take a, a, a child that, that didn't have uh, self-esteem and they branch out and they do things and we improve or have an impact as a student, those are the things that keep me going. I have got kids all the time. Sometimes my kids don't make it to green belt, but the impact I had from white to green was enough for their parents to come to me years later and go, Mr. Osborne, you did an excellent job with my kid. You know, um, he's, he or she is a part of the student government. Uh, they've got, we never thought that they would have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. They've got a girlfriend and a boyfriend. They, they <laughs> you know, it's, it's stuff like that that keeps me motivated. My impact with kids and my kids is different levels. Each kid is going to have a different 
level of way I've impact them. And I hope that they get something out of what I'm trying to teach them in the school. As far as the sports side of things is, I've, I've became a promoter in martial arts. I, I have an event here in the Midwest. Uh, it's a growing event. But my deal is to try and grow my sport. I want more players. I, I want more people involved. Like you're talking about, you want more people in the martial arts. I want more people in the martial arts also, and I want them more on the sports side of things. You know, we are one of those sports that are like the X Games back 20, 30 years ago. You know, it's a, it's a sport that hundreds of thousands of people do, but people don't pay attention to. I mean, we've got a couple right. spots on ESPN every once in a while with U.S. Open, but, you know, people don't realize that there's a tournament every weekend in the United States, January through December. There's a tournament. There's a cry tournament somewhere in the United States. You know, it may not be a big tournament, maybe a small tournament, maybe a mid-sized tournament, but there's a martial arts tournament going on somewhere every weekend. There's hundreds of thousands of people that do it. There's millions that do it across the world now. It's a global sport, and I want to lead my sport. And I may not make it nationally to where I can make an impact nationally. I'm just looking at my four states, and I call them my four states. I am not here by myself. There's lots of people that do the same thing I do in my four state region. But my personal goal is to make sure that, you know, as an aging demographic, as a martial artist, my kids and the kids that are coming behind me have something to go to when they get older. So I want to leave something behind. I want to make sure the sport's better than the way I left it. And the people before me left the sport better than when they left it. You know, we've got more divisions. We've got more things. We've got more avenues for kids. So my goal and my passion is to make sure that I take care of the ones that are next in line. You know, I want the next kids to be showcased. I want the next Raymond Daniels to be, you know, I hope he comes from Missouri or Arkansas, Oklahoma or Kansas. You know, I want those kids to have the limelight. I want them to be able to be shown across the United States going, look, we've got talent and martial arts is a talent like football, basketball, whatever the sport is. These are talented athletes, too. And here are their names and here's what they can do with social media and streaming and YouTube and Facebook. And You know, there's a our generation. I think it's and it's and I'm saying people that are our age, me and you, it's our job. And I feel like it's my job to use the resources we got now. The, the people that are that are our veterans that we look up to aren't with, you know, and I'm saying to all of them, but some aren't, you know, with the with the social technology. And it's up to us to make sure that, you know, the the social aspect gets out there for the kids. So, you know, I'm trying to shorten this up as best I can. I could probably go on for another hour, but but there are two sides to me. There's the teaching side and there's a the sports side, and both of them is building. I, I need to build something to make it better than the way I found it. Not what I found was bad, not the way I found was negative, but I need to make it better than the way I found it. And I think that's a great way to be, and it's a very admirable quality. Well, I appreciate and, and, it. And I applaud it. I, I mean, certainly, you know, as an entrepreneur, as the founder here at Whistlekick, I've got that same attitude. You're right. We could probably spend a whole hour on that. And who knows? Maybe we'll have you back on the show with a whole different set of questions okay. and, and we can dig into that. Sounds good. But but you did mention that you have a tournament. And so now is your chance to kind of promote yourself and what you've got going on. So why don't you tell us about that? Well, I, I host the Ozark Mountain Nationals. Um, you know, the, the naming of a tournament, when you say nationals, we draw from about seven states. Um, this will be my sixth year in 2016 of hosting the tournament. It started back in 2010. Um, we have one of the fastest growing open martial arts tournaments, probably, I don't know if it's in the United States, but I would say definitely within the six state region of me, you know, we're one of the fastest growing. My first tournament I had by myself, I did some tournaments with my family and then I started out on my own to do some stuff. My first tournament I had was in a small gymnasium in Ozark, Missouri, had 50 competitors. Um, and this past year I had 321 competitors and about six to 700 spectators. We had a little over a thousand people in our convention center. And so we have grown a small 50 person tournament to hundreds of people competing, drawing from different states, drawing from different organizations, getting people out that are not, you know, the thing with my tournament that I, I probably separates is that you will meet somebody new. The people in the flyover states, which are my states, Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, we have some great talent. Sometimes that talent, is able to, you know, go out and, and make a name for themselves. But we have a lot of talent that sometimes aren't able to travel. And so what I've done is try to build a national-looking tournament. What I mean by that 
nice convention center. We have a multi-billion dollar convention center. Uh, we do, um, we're getting ready to do this year, we've added a nighttime final showcase. And a lot of the adults over the years for national tournaments, they don't like the nighttime finals from what I'm gathering, and they don't want to stay that night. But the parents and the kids love it. So this year in my region, I'm holding the first time ever. We're going to stream it online. We're going to do an all-junior nighttime showcase. So the kids that won during the day, they're going to come back and get up on stage. We're going to have sparring and fighting. And we're going to make something special. We're going to stream it across the United States, maybe even internationally, whoever picks up the stream. And we're going to showcase the kids. And we're going to make sure the juniors, we're still going to have a lot of adults. So, you know, the tournament that I'm trying to build is just the, the adversity, or not adversity, diversity. You know, I want a diverse group. I want people to come to my tournament and meet somebody new. I want them to maybe meet a school that we got one school that, that comes to my tournament and they only do one tournament a year, but they go to my tournament. And that is the only opportunity that these other martial arts get to meet this group. And this group is extremently talented, but they only, they're not a sport. They, they just want to go to one. So that's what I'm trying to build is I'm trying to build something here that resembles a U.S. Open or a Diamond Nationals. But, you know, it's on a smaller scale. It's not to that size yet. But we bring in people that not everybody gets to see. You get to compete against people that you normally don't get to compete against. So it, it just gives a little bit different flavor, gives some new faces. And we're trying to grow this thing into something big to where the Midwest has got a big national tournament again. And I think that's great. Now, let's go back for a quick second. You said streaming. Yes. You're, so I'm going to implore you. When you have the information, how people can watch that, please. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping you and I aren't going to lose touch moving forward, but, you know, we're both busy. Regardless of, of how much we speak going forward, please get me that information so we can share it out with everyone. Because that's something that I completely agree should be happening. Let's get more martial arts competition out there for people to watch, even if it's on the Internet, to heck with TV. Yes, I, I most definitely will do that. We want right. we definitely want to showcase. We want to show the, the, the rest of the world and, and the nation how talented these martial arts are, and we'll, we'll definitely do that for sure. Fantastic. Well, this brings us to the end, but do you have any parting advice, any words of wisdom to leave everyone with? Well, I hope I didn't wear anybody out with my long answers. I mean, that is <laughs> the one thing that martial artists, most instructors are, are gifted with is, is the gift of gab. So I hope I didn't so true. hope nobody fell asleep during this interview. I really tried <laughs> to make sure I, I sometimes I know when to cut myself off and sometimes I don't. I just kind of keep rambling. So, you know, I, I hope people have the passion like I do with martial arts and they, and they see where I'm coming from. You know, sometimes honesty is a big key with me. You know, there's there's limitations on my martial arts career and there's some things that I do well and some things I don't do well. And, and I hope that was portrayed today is that I recognize those things and I'm trying to improve on those and trying to be a better martial artist. I have not hit a peak or a pinnacle or anything like that. I'm still growing as a martial artist. I'm still trying to build and, and I'm still trying to bring people along with me to build on that aspect. So, you know, I love martial arts. Hopefully that translates, you know, with us talking. It definitely did. And I don't think anybody fell asleep listening to you talk. You had a ton of energy in your words. So no worries there. Awesome. Well, Mr. Osborne, I really appreciate you coming on and being here on the show. You bet. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to episode 34 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Osborne. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including links to Mr. Osborne's event, the Ozark Mountain Nationals. We also have a video clip of the kitchen fight scene from Above the Law that we discussed. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our exclusive newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to help us out briefly, please leave us a five-star review wherever you downloaded this podcast. If we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. And don't forget to spread the word about our show to anyone that you think might like it. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick? Sparring gear, shirts, pants, and more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.